Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Teen Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. <laughs> well, that wasn't terribly silent, but at any rate, hero. <laughs> <laughs> hello, David, and hello to our listeners around the world. Welcome to Podcast 260. We have a really, really, really special, playful podcast for you today with extra special guests who are going to introduce themselves um, after I read this this endorsement. And these guests, they know each other really well, so they're going to do a great job of introducing themselves. Are, are, they, are, are they really special? They are very special. I know. That's really, good. really special. Oh, Rhonda. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so here's the, um, don't give away the secret. Here's the pot, here's the endorsement. This is from Robert Wiley, who's really, really, really valued and wonderful memory, member, member, member of the Wednesday training group. Mm-hmm. And he wrote to me, um, there are so many wonderful podcasts y'all have created. Seriously, I have cried many times in a good way and had been very inspired. I hope you and David know how much it means to me, and I'm sure countless others that you do these podcasts. Please don't stop. As always, sincerely, Rob Wiley. Thank you for that uh, wonderful note, Rob. We all appreciate it greatly, Rhonda and I. And uh, we have, this may be after today's podcast, but we've got a lot of live therapy sessions coming up, and I'm I'm very excited about them. And then we're going to do another live therapy in the Tuesday group tonight. So we have we're going to have at least you know three or four mind blowing live therapy sessions coming up, and th- those are my favorite, uh, except for t- today, which, as you point out, Rhonda is going to be you know very very special. <laughs> right. So, hey, to the special guests that know each other well, I, I give you the floor and allow, please ask, please introduce yourselves. Don't you remember their names or anything? I, I don't. can't either. I, I can't, can't either. remember. I know they're special, though. <laughs> <laughs> we're so special. We're going to introduce each other. And I'm going to start by introducing the fantastic Dr. Brandon Vance. And, you know, I met Brandon, um, he's a psychiatrist in Oakland, but what you don't know about him is that he is a world leader in underwater therapy. I met him at this fantastic conference. We were scuba diving underwater and learning how to really, you know, go deep with our clients. And Brandon really excels at um, octopus therapy as well. He is a foremost authority on getting uh, their tentacles out of their minds. And it's really quite extraordinary. I hope you're as inspired by Brandon as I am, Dr. Brandon Vance. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, it's all about the cephalopod and actually about the bubbles. It's bubble communication therapy, really, this whole new style of therapy underwater. Thank you so much for that introduction. That that was so sweet and so deep. It's really creating waves in me. Well, I would like to introduce the illustrious Dr. Heather Clegg. Um, Heather Clegg is a a wonderful psychiatrist, therapist, improv leader in in the East Bay. But what you don't know about Heather is that she once developed a way of making helium balloons, homemade helium balloons, which she would stitch together herself, and a concentrator of helium that would fill these balloons. And so she made a chair that then would float up with helium balloons and she would go over the pastures and over the mountains and the deep trees, uh, looking over the lands and, and actually 
um, contributing to the health and the mental health of people down below. Oh, I bet she was popular at Burning Man. Oh, very popular. Well, thank you so much, Brandon. I, I, uh, I really appreciated how you had that giant sign out for me when I passed over your house, um, cheering me on. And um, it was, you know, I did that solo flight all around the world in my helium chair and spread the love and good news um, all across the world. In fact, as I did that, I had small little um, Feeling Good podcast cards that I would cast out so that people could um, know about the Feeling Good podcast and listen in. Um, so I, I hope that I've done my part to increase the listenership to this wonderful podcast. It's actually been going down lately. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, maybe I use these biodegradable. I didn't want to create waste and they were biodegradable. So maybe that got in the way. Next time I'll, I'll have to figure something else out. Um, although actually the um, incredible Amy Spector, who is um, a therapist uh, also in the East Bay, um, who works uh, has a private practice and uh, works in a high school, um, she might actually come in handy for that because she has developed this new form of skywriting uh, communication, which she used both for personal and for therapeutic reasons, uh, purposes. And she has a special um, helicopter that she designed herself that um, sends out little colored farts. And for, with that, she can um, write all sorts of positive thoughts across the sky. So, um, uh, I'm sure she can do her part to plug the, the Feeling Good podcast. Well, that was you. I, I, I saw I smelled something the other day. It was really, really beautiful. It was beautiful smell. And, uh, you know, I really just got so tired of texting and spending all this time on my phone. So I really was inspired to create a new form of communication that was both visual and sensory in other ways. So thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, Heather. I thought that was just a helicopter fuel. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very special fuel that I use, you know, to get, to get all the all the senses engaged. Nice. Well, that was really fun. And Heather, Brandon, and Amy, what does that have to do with team? Well, we were just playing an improv game called Love Fest, um, which, as you see, you um, let someone know how awesome they are by um, being a little silly and fantastical. And when it goes well, the person picks up on what you said and rolls with it and kind of elaborates on it as you saw us doing. And um, I uh, run a, a school of improv called Berkeley Improv and we lead improv classes. And I like to think of improv as another method that we can use um, as part of team. Um, it's a, it can be thought of as a form of shame attacking. Um, uh, it's also, or, or social anxiety exposure. So um, I've had a number of clients with social anxiety um, who, after we've done empathy and agenda setting and done some work challenging their negative thoughts, they decide to take it to the next step and go take an improv class. And in fact, our, our beloved David Gurney, who's a member of the team community, has taken a class at our school. And he said he found it incredibly freeing um, to, take a, uh, to take an improv class. And he, felt, um, he noticed that he felt less judgmental and that helped him feel much more creative. Um, and the classes also, you know, they meet each week, people form community, they spend time together. Um, so it's also good for um, just all sorts of informal social practice. So would one of the goals then, uh, the meaning behind the madness of our silliness so far today would be that if you're very shy in social situations and uptight and afraid of saying something foolish or afraid of making a fool of yourself, you could actually take a class, an improv class, and practice doing that that exact thing. And it might be very anxiety-provoking for you initially, but as you got used to it, you might loosen up quite a bit and not be so afraid of, of making mistakes or saying something foolish or sounding foolish and then freeing yourself up to be much more alive and real with people in, in actual social situations. Is that somewhat the logic of it? Exactly. Absolutely, David. I couldn't have said it better. I, I was... Thank you. I, I prepared that ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking, David, also that the impro doing improv is a little bit like the acceptance paradox in action. Hmm. Right? You're really, you're a big thing of improv is saying yes to what comes at you, to accepting the gifts that your, your teammates give you. So you're saying yes to yourself and yes to what's happening. And, and allowing things to unfold very organically and spontaneously. I took a couple improv classes over the years, and I always feel much more alive when I do, like when I walk out of the class. And I think because I have some social anxiety myself, 
and then also this this idea of like playing and and playing with other people and and the yes and kind of idea that you're saying and i was thinking about it in you know t- thinking about this podcast and that play i think is so necessary for for the brain and for for our our minds to be able to um both develop trust and develop, you know, and kids, of course, are are playing all the time and, and parents are playing with the kids and that develops a connection and empathy and, and then an ability to be creative and ability to, um, to uh, explore and, and develop one's own cognition. And then I was also thinking about David and how you use humor and how that's kind of a disruptor. Like there's, we can get kind of locked in our thought patterns and we, we have all these methods to work with changing those thought patterns and then changing how we feel. And then there's humor that can come in and, and David, how you use it so skillfully that kind of helps us kind of say, Oh, wait a second, I can get out of that pattern of thinking. And that also related for me to your, those, those uh, chapters on the death of the self death of the four great deaths and the death of the special self. And if I'm, if I'm joking around and playing, I can't take myself so seriously. Um, or even the death of the fearful self or the angry blaming self or the entitled pleasure. You know, it's like, it's hard to be angry and blaming if I have that kind of lightheartedness as well. I think that's one of the reasons why the, the, I'll kind of date myself, but I, I was just totally mind blown by the late 1960s and all the crazy stuff that was going on with hippies and LSD and the human being. And I mean, life just became a party seven days a week. Mm-hmm. And I think people like to be children. We all like to play. We we never lose our fun of for, for playing, for doing something zany and, and and kind of kind of crazy. But as we get older we kind of get so serious and heavy and uh worrying about th- things and kind of lose that, that part and I think people can get in touch with that and want to get in touch with that and and kind of have fun just, just just like we did when we were kids. Yeah. Yeah, you know, in the Wednesday training group recently, I was teaching the method paradoxical magnification. Hmm. And I asked Heather to prepare. I asked Heather in advance if she knew any improv games. And she taught, she taught me this group, this game, if it's bad, make it worse, where you tell us one person tells a scene and then like five people after add to it and make it even worse. And um, just to magnify the ridiculousness of it. And so, and I said, we, you know, therapy can be fun. It doesn't have to be super heavy. And people in the class were kind of surprised that therapy can be fun. And um, I told, so my, the first scene I told was, um, my father has set me up on a date. And so five people were supposed to make that story worse. And And it's a long story, but I had previously talked about I had previously magnified something and brought in the the character the of uh, Jeffrey Dahmer so the person who went immediately after me said um my father set me up on a date and it was with Jeffrey Dahmer <laughs> <laughs> and I thought oh my god that's the first one it has to go to four other people what could they possibly say and everybody added something really funny but the person who went last made it so great and said my father set me up on a date it was with Jeffrey Dahmer and the problem was I really liked him <laughs> and, and, you know, it was just such a fun way of learning that technique of paradoxical magnification. Um, I'll tell you something else. Yes. I like Jeffrey Dahmer <laughs> a lot too, although he's dead now because he yes. was killed in prison, but he had a TV interview on YouTube and he was the most likable person I've ever seen on television. Mm-hmm. It was it was fantastic. It was really mind. It was with his father. We won't talk about it now since we're on a lighter subject. But it was it was the most moving. And you know, you you get this idea that people are all bad. You know, we label people. That's a topic for another day. But he 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 did horrible things. But he he also had a a, a really humble and you know be- beautiful part of his personality that was that he displayed on that interview. It was fantastic. Mm. I, I like him too. <laughs> <laughs> well, Amy, tell us about how you created these games and how they're related to team. 
Yeah, well, um, I, I just completely agree that therapy can be really fun. And I think David has been such an inspiration and a leader and a mentor in this area that you can be working on really serious issues and still have humor and still be playful. And so Brandon and I used to teach a class called Monday Method Madness. And we were going through different team methods and bringing them to life often through games. So we came up with various games depending on whatever method we were trying to teach and learn that week. And um, one of the games we came up with called Tune In, Tune Up is a game that we ended up actually manufacturing and marketing and um, is now available for sale on our website, on the Feeling Great Therapy Center website, which we will link if anyone's interested. Um, and we created this game. So this game in particular is a conversation skills game. And we were noticing that a lot of conversation games just have a prompt. So they'll just give you a question. And some of the questions are wonderful and great. You know, the ungame, if you're a therapist, probably, uh, you know, most therapists know the ungame. What, what, what's the, the ungame? I don't know. It. Oh, you don't know the end game? Oh, we'll have to play the end game sometime, David. It's super fun. Um, it's just a li it's basically just questions that you ask, you know, so it's a therapeutic game. You might ask a question like, tell me something um, about your, you know, an early memory that you had or talk about a favorite meal that you've eaten. Um, so, you know, they, they can be lighthearted questions. They can be deeper questions. And then the person just opens up oh. and talks about them. And that's great. That's wonderful totally respectable, wonderful thing to do. But what Brandon and I noticed is there was no skill oh, yeah. teaching involved. So the game just, you know, happened and, you know, maybe somebody answered and, and, you know, the next person moved on, but we really wanted to add that interactive element and really bring in some of the five secrets and things like shame attacking and really build that into a fun game as a fun way that someone in therapy or even just, you know, a, per a person out in the world could be playing a game and learning some communication skills. Um, so that is why we created this next game that we're gonna play called Tune In. And Tune just a little up. story about that before we dive into it, there's a friend of mine who, to whom I gave a little card set of, of Tune In, Tune Up, and she brought it on a first date and they played it on the first date. And she she called me after and she was like, that was the most amazing first date because we got really deep into things with each other because we were asking each other these kind of deep questions and then having to tune into each other, having to be really connected. Um, and then she gave some cards from the set to a friend of hers for the friend's first date, which, which was cool. And now they're happily married. Right, <laughs> they actually, so the second date, she didn't bring the cards and it didn't go as well. She was like, Oh, we don't have much to talk about. So <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Amy, how do you play the game? How do you play okay, it? Okay, well, the, the way you play is uh, it's, it's a card game, but um, on our Zoom version today, we are just going to take turns asking each other questions from the cards. And the way it works is um, we're each going to read exactly what the card says and then do what the card says. So I'm going to read uh, my card and then I'm going to ask Brandon the question on my card. And then after we do the question, we're going to tell you what communication skill or what team method we just illustrated with that card. So Brandon, are you ready? I am ready, Amy. So my card says, ask the person, the next person to talk about a conversation they wish they could have with someone. When they finish, ask a follow-up question. If your question leads them to speak more in depth about some part of what they told you, give yourself a point. And should we say what communication skill this is teaching or do that at the end? What, David, it's um, up to you. David's jumping at the bit. So David, what communication skill is this teaching? Tell us. Uh, disarming. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Yeah. And I, I was thinking inquiry too. Oh, oh, inquiry. That's why you ask questions. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Let's see you guys do it. All right. So Brandon, tell me about a conversation you wish you could have with someone. Mm. You know, when you say this, so there was this time when I was in medical school and they were filming Patch Adams which is a, a, a movie about this a real person, Patch Adams, who was a physician, but he was a clown as well. And he would use clowning in, in his work with people as a physician. And so like, like Gacy or Daisy. 
Gacy. I don't know. He was that serial killer who was a clown. <laughs> I no, I think it's a little different actually. But um yeah, so during that, so Robin Williams was playing Patch Adams, and I was at the grocery store one day and there was Robin Williams. And I was like, and everybody's kind of looking at him out of the corner of their eye. And I went up to him and, and I was like, good, good place to shop. <laughs> Because so I was just nervous. I wanted to say something. And, but then it struck me afterwards that, like, I could have invited him out to Pepper's Pizza, this great pizza joint in Chapel Hill, where we where our medical school was, where they were filming this. And he could have had dinner with a bunch of medical students as he was filming this. And he might have actually done that. And there's a really funny uh, friend of mine who was in my class. And I think we would have just had the most hilarious dinner. So I wish I could have, have had a dinner with Robin Williams and, and asked him about all kinds of things and, and just had a really fun time. All right. I'm dying to know, Brandon, what's one question you would have asked Robin Williams at that dinner? I would have asked him, you know, I think he would take anything and he'd just fly with it. Um, I would ask him, um, I would ask him about what he, what he fears. I'd try to get it like some of his negative thoughts. I'd be, be interested in, in that. Or I'd pull out tune in, tune up and I'd ask him one of the questions from that. Of course, if only it had been invented then. <laughs> Great. Now, Thank you. All right. So I'm going to give myself a point because I asked you a, a question and you answered it. Um, now I just want to make a follow-up so. comment here uh, so our listeners will understand what we're doing and and why and why you've created these games. The, uh, the, the tools of TAME are pretty powerful and they're they're kind of serious and we often teach them in serious ways like inquiry is one of the five secrets of effective communication uh, but this is a way that you if you were wanting to teach these skills to a group for example a group of children this would be a fun way and a non-threatening way for them to learn and that technique inquiry can be a life-changing technique, really, if, if you learn to use it and you use it a lot. It makes you more other-centered in your conversation. It's a tremendous tool for, for shy people to use because you often think you have to impress people by talking about yourself. And that really ne never works. People get irritated when you try to impress them. But when you ask people about themselves, they really like it because people like to be the center of attention. And and uh, Amy is going to guide us now and show us how how we can use exactly the same format you use to practice other techniques like thought empathy, feeling empathy, uh, the disarming t t technique, I, I feel statements, and so forth. Yeah. So so I have a card that that uh, practices thought empathy and feeling empathy, and I'd love to ask it to you, David. Mm -hmm. uh, my card says, so first I'll read the card and then I'll, and then I'll ask you the question. So the card says, ask the next person to talk about a terrible date or family outing they went on. Then restate what they said and how it might have felt at that time. If your partner says you nailed it, give yourself a point. So this tests my ability or practices my ability to, to give thought and feeling empathy to David to restate what he, he's saying and then how he might have felt. Um, so, David, so tell me about a terrible date or family outing that you went on. Well, let's see. I can't think of any terrible family outings. I can think of one really terrible blind date mm -hmm. and and, a, and an awful lot of non-dates that I would have loved to have had but never did. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think I have a vague memory of... Uh, uh, you know, some when I was in medical school, somebody kind of set me up with some young lady, and uh, oh no, I can think of another one that was uh, perhaps a bit more col colorful. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had, I had, I had met this this young lady, and somehow ended up in her in her apartment with her. And and it actually went, you know, super well. 
but then then we heard this car pulling up and she said oh my gosh that's my boyfriend <laughs> and so i freaked out and, and and jumped out the back window and went over and got on my motorcycle and sped off um. Never saw her again. <laughs> oh, thanks, David. So, so you met this 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 young woman. Went to her apartment. It went super well. And then and then you heard this car pull up, and and she was like, "Oh my god, that's my boyfriend!" And you jumped out of her back window and got in your motorcycle and, and you took off. Um, and I can only imagine you must have felt like super anxious, like you said, freaked out. And and I could imagine. Um, just being kind of panicked if I were you. Um, and- Absolutely. I was just glad I got out of there with my skin. <laughs> oh, I'm so relieved after you get out of there with your skin. Yeah. How, how did I do, David, at, at uh, thought and feeling? You, you nailed it. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, cool. So I get a point there. Yeah, for for thought, empathy, and 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 what you did really with the skill was just to paraphrase what I had said, and then acknowledge h- how I was feeling, and to do it in a simple way without interjecting a lot of your own ideas or your own interpretations, just again being very other centered. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, now it's your turn, David. So you can ask the, your card to Heather. To Heather, uh, let's read your card. Oh yeah. yeah. So I'm supposed to ask Heather to talk about a meaningful song f- for up to a minute. Uh, I'm supposed to restate what she says. That's thought empathy, and then I'm supposed to sing at least one verse of the song uh, if I know it. If not, I'll make up a verse and sing it. And then, uh, and then, uh, if I can sing it, I can toot my own horn by stealing a point from someone else. Nice. Okay. So, Heather, can you talk about a uh, a deeply meaningful song that has inspired you? And you can talk for for a full minute. <laughs> Thank you, David. Well, yes. So I used to go blues dancing. And I really, really loved the song by Nina Simone, Feeling Good. And this was before I was aware of you and your work. And um, this was a favorite song. And then um, fate would have it that I came to your intensive conference in 2014 and um, became a part of the team movement. And then it was funny how my mind didn't really put it together until one day I was like, oh my God, Feeling Good. I love that song. And David's book. Feeling good, and so I had at least one or two moments of dancing around my kitchen, singing the "Feeling Good" song to myself. <laughs> and then, as you may know, Brandon wrote a cover of the "Feeling Good" song, "Feeling Great," um, which was actually on a previous podcast, I think. <laughs> so I think you could you could have the option of either singing a verse of "Feeling Good" or a verse of "Feeling Great." Okay. Well, I think I'm first supposed to summarize what you said. Yeah. And um, and you said that you really uh, you love uh, blue dancing or blues dancing, and one of your favorite songs is "Feeling Good" by Nina Simone. And then uh, you you came to my 2014 conference, probably the South San Francisco intensive, or maybe one of the others, and you liked that and became a part of the team. Uh, you know, therapy movement and community, and uh, once or twice uh, danced danced around the kitchen singing uh, F- "Feeling Good," and then Brandon wrote "Feeling Great," and I have to post that on my website. I that's that's something I forgot to do, and so after this, Brandon, we have to reconnect so I can post that video. It's the the music video you created for my good. book "Feeling Great." And now I will sing a ver- verse from Feeling Good, since I, I have no idea what the song sounds like. <laughs> but I am feeling good, like a good boy should. And I'm from the hood, that's why I'm feeling good. Yay! Beautiful <laughs> <laughs> voice, David. I mean, uh, before you were kind of playful with it, it, it really did. 
I like that. <laughs> Fantastic. It's and not have... copyrighted. You can steal it. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, now you get to steal a point from someone else. Okay, well, who has a point for me to steal? Brandon and I both have a point, so you you can choose. Okay, well, I'll I'll, I'll take uh, this. Amy, is that who's? Y'll, I'll take yeah. take a point from Amy. You may have it for that beautiful oh, I'm song. I'm so relieved. <laughs> I get to keep my point. <laughs> um, but the point there. Uh, there were two points to that. Again, I think we have to make our teaching points so people don't think we're just kind of wasting time and doing stupid things, although that's what we actually are doing. But uh, the, the thing is is that I had to practice thought empathy to get – and I did it by writing down and taking notes, and I do that during therapy sessions too, to jot down what the patient is saying. I'll do that on the live work I do tonight with Jill and one of the people in our group who's – feeling uh, fearful about maybe not being able to have a baby. And uh, that, that helps me really tune in to what the patient is, is saying. And you can do that in conversation just to re repeat what people said. And then you can follow it with a, a question or by agreeing with them. In this case, I had to, to, to combine it with shame attacking, to do something foolish in public, make a fool of myself on purpose and find out if the, if the world would, would come to an end. Well, oh, and now it looks like Heather, you're up. Right. So here's my card, which just is some more shame attacking. Um, get the group to make farting noises with you. Give yourself a point if everyone toots. Then steal a point from the player with the most timid fart sound. So, group, I know. We do these one at a time or all at once? I think we should make a si simultaneous symphony of farting noises. On the count of three. One, two, three. Um, that was, uh, I think I, I deserve a point. Now, um, those were all pretty loud. Uh, uh, I don't know, Rhonda, maybe I heard yours the least. So. Oh, you heard mine the least? Okay. I don't have a point to give you, but if I did, I would give it to you. Okay, but I get an extra point. Could you do a solo fart for us, Rhonda? A solo fart? Okay, I'll have to make it really loud. <laughs> the visuals there are priceless. Yeah, I, I like that little squeak at the end. I've never heard that in the bathroom, uh, a squeaking fart. My favorite sound is, is the sound of explosive diarrhea. It's my favorite one to do also. Just a huge explosive splat. <laughs> so gratifying. Let's hear that, David. It just, you know, you sit down at, and then you hear the water splattering too and splashing around. <laughs> oh gosh, that's hilarious. And um, do you want to give an explanation about what shame attacking is for and what's that all about? Yeah, I, I, I can, or one of you three can. I can explain that. Um, so um, shame attacking is where you deliberately do something that provoke feelings of embarrassment or shame, um, typically by doing something kind of silly and playful in public um, that you fear might elicit a negative reaction. And um, this is a way of attacking that feeling of shame by not obeying it, by doing something kind of outside the lines of what your mind is telling you you should be doing. And, and this is a little safer because you're doing it in a group as a game. And then after this, you can graduate to real shame attacking exercises where you have to go out and actually do them individually on, on, on your own. Uh, like, uh, and I've done this a lot in, in workshops. I've taken a group of 100 people out break them up into little small groups and you go walk around Boston or wherever you are and you have to, everyone has to walk up to strangers and do, you know, just really foolish things. And again, the, and, and, it, and you don't ever want to threaten the person or make them fearful or do something aggressive, but you just kind of want to make a fool of yourself. Like you can walk up to someone and offer to give them skipping lessons uh, and you can give a free lesson or a demonstration. And then when I've done this, I often 
say, I'll, I'll show you, you know, what you can learn to do. And then I start skipping and I can't remember how to skip. So it looks pretty, pretty ridiculous, but that, you know, any kind of fun, crazy thing. And then the idea behind it again, this is a very serious exercise uh, for people with social anxiety who are, you know, afraid to, 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 to make a fool of yourself in, in public and uh, it can be very frightening, but uh, it, it can really be, be life-changing. And the first time I did one, it was terrified the heck out of me. And, and now I, I do them very, very readily. And I, th I think it really does, d does help tremendously break that, that intense fear, the the trap, the uh, the tight jacket, the straight jacket that uh, shy people are in, hold, holding yourself in and being afraid to look so foolish, and you just get out there and m make a royal f fool of yourself, and uh, you you discover that the that the world doesn't come to an end. In one of the podcasts I had on shame attacking, I think I posted a show note with uh, 100 suggested shame attacking exercises. So if any of you are interested in this theme, and I, th I think it's it's a silly but incredibly powerful and important t t technique, uh, it, it's definitely worth, worth learning. And some people are even forming uh, shame attacking groups that meet uh, weekly and they go out and do shame attacking and report to each other on their shame attacking. And it's, it's a great tonic for social anxiety. Thank you. Okay, here's the last one. And I'm going to read the card. And I'm going to be reading this to Amy. So the card says, ask the next person to talk about where they would never want to go in the world and why. Then find something in what they said to agree with wholeheartedly. If you can find that special something, give yourself a point. So Amy, where would you never want to go in the world and why not? Why would you not? Why wouldn't you want to go there? Well, Rhonda, I would never want to go to an ice cave um, because I would be very, very, very cold. I'm always cold anyway, so I'm not going to, you know, put myself in a situation that would make me even colder. And then I, you know, kind of have uh, a worry about caves, like it might collapse on me or, you know, I'd feel claustrophobic. Maybe I wouldn't be able to find my way out. So an ice cave is definitely a place I would never, never go. Oh my gosh, Amy, you are so right. An ice cave is really, really, really cold. And you just told me that you're always cold. And so going into an ice cave would be someplace that would you would never want to go. You'd really want to avoid because if you're always cold and you go into an ice cave, you would be even colder. And there's such a there's something about caves where the, you you know you might have this fear of of collapsing, and I completely agree with you. I I have that fear too, and that sense of claustrophobia, like you're just you can't get out. I can completely, I completely can see why you would not want to go to an ice cave. Beautiful. Well, and and shall I say that that was an example of disarming, where I found some truth in what you said. And I think I found some truth in what you said. What do you think, Amy? Should I give myself a point? Absolutely. You you found um, a lot of truth in what I said. I felt really understood because you were agreeing so wholeheartedly with the parts of my ice cave um, non-travel <laughs> wish list there. <laughs> so you did a great job, Rhonda. Thanks. And well, give yourself a point, but actually give it to Heather because she stole it from you for your timid farting. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now we practice the five secrets with some pretty intense and challenging exercises in our training groups. Uh, explain why this might be uh, a, 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 an easier way uh, to at least get introduced to the five secrets, if, especially if you have a class training tra training group. And because I didn't you do this at the start of all of your book club meetings. We, we actually didn't use this one in our book club meeting, but we did use it some in small groups when we've done kind of a well, training. That, for that's what I mean. This is the one you were doing? Yeah. Well, yeah, we did a few different ones, but yeah, this was one of the ones. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's just a different way. I mean, I think there are all kinds of ways to practice the five secrets and, 
getting a lot of practice is important because they're really difficult to learn. They, they may seem more simple on the surface, but they're, they're difficult to do and to do well. And so, um, so this gives people scenarios and it kind of on the fly, then you have to, to restate maybe what the person's saying and how they feel thought and feeling empathy, um, or other use other techniques on the fly, which, um, which is kind of a non-threatening way to do it. Um, and then later we could get into somebody giving you, a, you know, an overt criticism that's really difficult. And that's maybe another level of, for example, disarming when somebody's really angry at me and finding the truth in what they say. But starting with something a little milder can, can be fun and, and it can be a way to practice it. Can Good. we practice that one now? Just regular disarming or is that off topic or I mean, well, I think might... we're going to, I think we're going to go to another game. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause, um, cause this is about playfulness and, but Amy, b before we go, I just want to ask you one more question. You said that you're selling this game, tune in, tune up. How, how, tell us about that a little bit. Are you uh, selling it? Yes, it is for sale on the feeling great therapy center website. We have a link to um, play therapy supply um, and and you'll be able to purchase the game there and it's super super fun it's a game you can buy if you're a therapist you can use it in session with your clients um, you can even you know play I, I play it all the time with my high school students they really love it it's really fun and interactive um, like you were saying, it's a really non-threatening way, really gentle, easy way to get a chance to practice the five secrets. And what you're purchasing essentially is a deck of cards that, with all the instructions on, on the cards that you use in the game. Exactly. Everything you need is contained in this magic box that you listeners at home cannot see. Is that yeah. the one that you had? That you were sent to telling us that was only is on special for $199 now <laughs> on this exactly. month only? Just this month, only $199, but you also get a free copy of Flirty Dice, which is the next <laughs> absolutely bargain basement price. It's worth 10 times that, you know, based on, you know, Brandon's, I definitely, everyone who's going on a first date should definitely take Tune In, Tune Up with them. I think it could be really cool that way. You know, it is actually, we put, did make it on sale during the pandemic because, you know, people were isolated, wanted to to really encourage different ways of, of connecting with folks, um, especially during the pandemic. So it's still on sale. Um, and also just wanted to, and so it does, isn't just the five secrets. It's also using some other techniques um, that are team related techniques, um, kind of one minute drill. And, and there's some, um, and other, other skills of observation, like one is where you close your eyes and somebody changes something about their appearance. And then you try to notice what what they change. So, tuning into people. Um, there's a and a lot of just other games that we kind of created a little bit. Like Amy mentioned paradoxical or Rhonda mentioned paradoxical magnification, and Amy had come up with this paradoxical mag libs off of the mad libs, um, where you kind of magnify things. And there's one called connect more, which was also five secrets related. There's a student of mine who made something called glad libs which relates to the daily mood log and kind of a way to do that. So I think just the idea of being playful about it and, and different ways to learn some of these tools and practice them. Nice. And it, it really isn't $199. How much are they really? I think it's 189, right? <laughs> I think right now they're 15. Um, they, they're usually 30, but I think they're 15 per set right now. Oh. Cool. And you have one more game for us to play flirty dice. Tell us about that. We do. Well, uh, one of the really super fun methods in Team CBT is flirtation training. And this is really an important tool that people who experience social anxiety or, you know, one of my specialties in private practice is breakup recovery. So helping people who have been through a rough breakup um, and often both kind of social anxiety, shyness and breakup recovery have in common that you ha lack self-confidence and feel very self-conscious. So flirty dice is a really fun way to kind of get you out of your shell, get you in a playful mood and get you relating to people in a way where you're not taking yourself so seriously. It usually ends in a lot of giggling and laughter because it's, well, as you'll see and witness in a moment, it's it can get pretty silly. Um, so I'm gonna read the directions out loud. We are gonna use for this, um, and this game is available for free for download on our website, feelinggreattherapycenter.com. 
and um, you can just use regular dice or on your phone, you can get an app that will roll dice for you. So I'm just gonna use a virtual dice roller for this and how we're gonna play, we're gonna go in our same order. I'm gonna read the directions and then I'll start and I will um, start by flirting with the fabulous Dr. Brandon Vance and then we will move on down our line here. And I will just let you all know what your what your dice roll was. So I will be rolling the dice for everyone today. And then you you do the uh, the, the 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 number one through six. Mm -hmm. And since they can't see this, maybe we can have it as a a link or something on yeah. the show notes. But the, yeah. the there's something you have to do non verbally, like like touch your face. I always do that when I'm flirting mm -hmm. or, or like this kind of. <laughs> 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 and then ask about a favorite thing in, in, in a whisper. Uh, that would be your assignment. And there's six of these cool assignments. Yes. So we are going to, I'll read the directions. And then um, Brandon, Heather, and Rhonda are each going to read one of the columns, the nonverbal, the verbal, and the style columns. So you'll hear everything before we start rolling the dice here. Okay. So the directions for flirty dice. The person with the longest eyelashes goes first, which is going to be me because I know, look at those lashes. Okay, we're gonna roll three <laughs> dice, turn to the person, to the next person and follow the key below to put together your unique flirt. Don't show the other players the flirting key on your turn. You want them to be surprised by your flirt. When you are the object of the flirting, you can respond to what is happening in the moment. Answer any questions, giggle back, etc. Feeling competitive? Keep track of the total points you roll each round. The winner is the person with the score closest to 69. Okay, so um, Brandon, would you read the nonverbal column? What are our one through six on nonverbals? Yeah, so the first die roll is if you roll a number one, it's touch your face. Number two is giggle. Number three is smile. Four, lick or bite your own lips. Five is lean in. And six is wink. All right. <laughs> and uh, how do you read the verbal column? Hey, so on your second die roll, if you roll a one, you are going to ask about a favorite thing. If you roll a two on the second die roll, you will compliment their appearance. If you roll a three, you will tell them how they make you feel. If you roll a four, you will make a positive comparison. If you roll a five, you will ask a personal question. And if you roll a six, you will find out one thing you didn't know you had in common. Mm -hmm. Great. And Rhonda, will you finish us off with the style column? Okay. On your third die roll, if you roll a one, you have to speak in a whisper. If you roll a two, you have to say it while gazing into the other person's eyes. If you roll a three, you have to lower the pitch of your voice as you say it. Say it huskily. Husky. If you roll a four, you have to say it suggestively. Five. Start to say it and then say, no, never mind, I shouldn't. And if you roll a six, you have to say it passionately. All right, beautiful. So I'm going to start us off with my long eyelashes here. And I got a six, five, six. So I'm going to wink, ask a personal question, and say it passionately to Brandon. All right, here we go, Brandon. Brandon. <laughs> What did you have for breakfast? Oh, wow, Amy. Gosh, I, I mean, I, I, I am I'm nervous even responding, but I, I had eggs. I mean, I, I kind of felt the eggs I, and I, I, I had them. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Wow. Wow. Right. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing about your eggs. Mm. Okay. Do that with anybody. Just yeah. So so one of you had to do six and one of you had to do five. Is that correct? Or no, not correct? Brandon, Brandon did them all. Yeah, so each person does. Uh, the, the, the flirt is one item from each column. And Brandon just answered Amy. Amy did yeah. one from each I, column I, and Brandon answered. Oh, Amy did all from column six. Row six. Um, she got a six, a five, and a six. So she had to do the nonverbal six, which is wink, and then the verbal five, which was ask a personal question. And then the style is the third die roll, which was a six, which she. Oh, had to I see. So it combines these in various ways depending on your, uh, like if you get a two or three, you, you, you I, I still don't get it. Like, okay, if well, you let's get do another one. Two numbers. 
What, uh, uh, I'm rolling what you can't see, David, is I'm rolling three dice. Oh, three. Oh, okay. You get three. Yeah. Three. So oh, you, oh, I get so it. You get three numbers. With one for each oh, column, okay. Right? Yeah. A verbal, a verbal, and a yeah. style. Okay. Okay. And you're going to see, you You are about to be so lucky, Brand, uh, David, because Brandon is going to flirt with you. So look out. You're probably going to fall in love I, with him. I already am. Brandon, I mean, uh, fall in love with him even more if that was possible. Um, Brandon, you had a five, a one, and a three. Wow. All right. So I so I need to lean in and then ask about a favorite thing and then lower the pitch of my voice in a world of David. Um, okay, and, and say it husky, as Rhonda said. Okay, so David, oh, I would just I would love to know about what your favorite kind of dessert is. It would just, it would just make me feel so, so wonderful and so connected to you to, to know how you savor the favorite dessert. Well, I'm, I'm kind of on a ultra low carb diet at the moment. (laughs) So, uh, uh, but back in the olden days, it was, it's hard, hard to beat blueberry, a piece of blueberry pie. Mm. Uh, Ultra low carb is sexy and hard. (laughs) Blueberry pie. Oh my God, David. Stop. All right, David, you are up next. You are flirting with Heather. And you have a three, a three, and a four. So you're going to smile, tell Heather how she makes you feel, and say it suggestively. (laughs) (laughs) You make me feel, well, you know. (laughs) I think you know. Oh, David. <laughs> Heather was pushing for the listeners. That was that was deep. <laughs> I felt that was so deep. Tough. Heather, you have a five, a four, and a one for your flirt with Rhonda. Right. So I'm gonna lean in, make a positive comparison, and say it in a whisper. Mm. <sighs> You are so much better than all those other podcast hosts. <laughs> oh my God, you're whispering, Heather. I can't hear you say it louder. <laughs> Hello to the world. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> nice. Just for the sake of time, Amy, give me one real quick. Okay, um, Rhonda, why don't you do four, lick your, or bite your own lips, Um Two, compliment my appearance, <laughs> and five, start to say it and then say, no, never mind, I shouldn't. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, Amy, I just love your, oh, oh maybe, I, never mind, I, I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish you would, though, Rhonda. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, that is flirty dice. That is super fun. It's too bad we're not on video. I know. Then, then we could, uh, like, all try, like, kind of biting our lips at the same time. We could do it for our own entertainment right now. I know. Okay, so let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> or licking them or licking our lips. Go ahead and do a screenshot. That can be our. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's all do a wink on the count of three. <laughs> That's good, Brandon. Yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe we can get uh, some screenshots of that off of the Zoom, and then we can post them. Uh, we can post them on the on the show notes, maybe. Okay, Amy, did I got it. All right, one on the count of three. One. What, which what we, are we what supposed are we doing? to do? Uh, lick your lips or and and wink. Okay, at the same at time. At the same time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs> Keep it going. Keep it going. Don't stop. <laughs> can can any can any of you do this with your lips? There was there's some rock singer from years ago used to do this when he was singing. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. 
kind of a snarl. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're going to play one more game. And we that have time to do, to, to yeah, do we have another? One, we have time for one more game because this is going to be, in a way, our closing. Um, okay. But, so we're going to do uh, the team method t- future projection, and we're going to share a negative thought, and then we're going to do play the game um, one word at a time. Okay. Can I explain this? You, why don't you explain it, Heather? Yeah. So this is a word at a time game. So we're going to go in a you know in our same order alphabetical. Oh, and- just at, just as an aside, I mean to interrupt. These all have a purpose, and that flirting training game. Flirting training is one of the team techniques for shy, lonely people, teach people how, how to flirt. And this would be something that could be done very nicely in a, in a group setting, say in a high school or in a college. Uh, one of our therapists, Jacob Towery, did a, a shyness training group at the Stanford Student Health Service a number of years ago that was very successful. And, and games like this could be incorporated in, into such groups, which would have both, you know, serious purpose, but could also have a lot of fun dimensions as, as, as well. Uh, All right. Hey. Well, so this is our, our yeah, our, our closing game, and it's... Um, the, the technique of future projection, where you imagine yourself in the future having worked through whatever you're struggling with, and your future self talks to you and, and, and gives you some wisdom from the future. And the variant we're going to do is we're going to do it collectively as a group with each person saying one word at a time. So um, to get us started, we need someone with a negative thought. Um, is there anybody here who's had a negative thought? Well, I think um, we're going to... Oh, go ahead, David. I just, since I'm working on this on the app all day long, I mean, common ones are kind of like the self-critical ones, like I'm not good enough is very common, or I shouldn't be so screwed up is common, or the hopeless thought that things will never change, uh, I'll be, you know, depressed forever type of thing. Mm-hmm. Those are those are some common ones. Or, or yeah. when I give my talk, I know I'm going to blow it. My mind's going to go blank. That's a common anxious thought that people have. Absolutely, Heather. Why don't you pick pick one from that group? Okay. How about um, uh, well, when I when I give my talk, I'm going to blow it, and every, I'm going to look stupid, and and uh, everyone's going to look down on me. So. Now, um, we're going to respond to that negative thought from a wise future self. Um, And each of us is going to contribute one word at a time. Amy, do you want to get us started? My. Gosh. David, you go next. I. Feel. So. Empowered. And and suicidal. (laughs) (laughs) I can't imagine being more proud of my big hearted. Suicidal thoughts. You should really start to appreciate me always. And furthermore, you should remember deeply. And intensely that I'm amphibious. (laughs) (laughs) Great. And and what were we doing? I kind of lost track of the point of that one. Well, the intention was to speak from our wise future self. We're supposed to be generating a positive thought. Is that is that right? Yes. Yeah. Our, our oh. wise future self had a few issues. <laughs> our, <laughs> our, wine, our wise future self is supposed to be comforting our current 
um, saw for oh. having the negative thoughts. Oh. <laughs> but it was more fun this way. It was suicidal for the death of the special self. It was one. Yeah, of the- that's right. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's figure out a way to improvise the closing. But first, I want to thank you, Brandon and Heather and Amy, for coming onto the podcast and sharing the wisdom that you have brought with you, and you know, honoring the playfulness that we all have and the child self that we all, you know, sometimes we don't get a chance to express it enough. And so, I hope everybody takes this podcast and um, has fun has fun in them, in their own life and, and brings fun into their therapeutic lives. Or if you're a teacher and working with kids, uh, grammar school kids or high school kids or even college kids, uh, and you're trying to work on emotional issues or social skills kind of issues, some of these games might be might enhance enhance your, your cause. I know when I was in Philadelphia, we developed uh, 45 cognitive therapy games that we used in the inpatient unit that where we had people with intense uh, schizophrenia who were hospitalized for, for fulminant psychotic episodes. And then they played these these games for generally 45 minutes. They're radically different from these, but they were a lot of fun for them. And each game brought a, an idea like about uh, your thoughts create your moods or about one of the cognitive distortions and things. And that was that was very, very popular among the patients on, on that on that ward as, as well, gave them a way of kind of learning about some of the cognitive therapy ideas in a, in a fun and, and exciting group and engaging activity. Mm, that's, nice. that. that's really cool. And so Amy, you said that the flirty dice game is for free and yep. anybody can download it. Anybody and, uh, tune in tune up game is for sale for $15 and you can get them through the Feeling Great Therapy Center website, there's a resource tab. So anybody can check out that resource tab and, and have access to these games. These and much more. Yeah. Thank you, Rhonda and David. This was really fun. Thank you, folks, for coming, coming on our podcast. It's always great seeing you and appreciating your creativity and innovation and warmth as well mm. and, and, and brilliant and and handsomeness and, and beauty and uh, agility. Uh, and I, I like all of you very much. Yeah, don't stop there. You can keep going. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. okay. Till next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.